This is a new presentation of a Gould Standard podcast, which first aired in February of 2022. We hope you enjoy this new YouTube video exclusive with the formidable Nare Soul. Hello, everybody. I'm Brian Levine, and welcome to the Gould Standard, a podcast brought to you by the Glenn Gould Foundation. Once again, we're here to bring you conversations with some of the most remarkable people from all across the world of the arts. If music, film, books, dance, poetry, visual art, theater, novels, or design are the bubbles in the Veuve Clicquot of your life, you have come to the right place, my friends. But first, while you're stopping by under our hypnotically glowing neon piano sign, please do take a moment to press like, share, and subscribe. When you subscribe, you'll get word about all our upcoming episodes before they come down the track. And if you happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, please kindly leave your reviews, pose your questions, and be part of our community of friends and supporters. And to get more sparkling sounds, witty words, and intriguing images, we'd love it if you'd pay us a visit at our website, www.glengould.ca. While you're there, you will notice a very prominent donate button. We are, in fact, a Canadian registered charity, and we would be so grateful if you would support us in our work. Now, I'm joined today by a wonderful musician and composer, an artist, and above all, communicator. And if you don't know her work already, I predict that you'll be a fan by the time we're finished today. Now, for those of us who have spent our lives in and around the world of so-called classical music, one of the most tiresomely persistent questions is whether this music is a dying art. As a matter of fact, people have been asking that question since long before Chuck Berry told Beethoven to roll over. But setting aside the challenges that all the performing arts face from the COVID pandemic, I think it's safe to say the classical music isn't going anywhere in a hurry, and there are hundreds of millions of people who listen to it and enjoy it every day, and plenty more who compose and perform it. According to, to the IFPI, the recorded music industry generated revenues of $21.6 billion in 2021, and I've seen estimates that classical music is about 2.5% of that. Now, that may seem like a tiny number to you until you do the math and learn that that's $540 million just from the recordings. That's a larger percentage, incidentally, than world music, reggae, new age, Latin, EDM, and roughly the same size as jazz. Besides, when you come down to it, what do people even mean by classical music anyway? It's music that covers a span of a thousand years from the Middle Ages to today, dozens of countries, and a vast array of nationalities, ethno-racial and religious heritages, and political and economic environments. But the fact does remain that classical music does face some serious challenges. Institutionally, despite the positive attempts that uh, some have been making to loosen its starched cravat and tailcoat, it remains a pretty conservative realm. In North America, at least, its audience is trending older, which apparently is considered something quite shameful, and it's largely non-commercial, so nobody is pouring gazillions of dollars into promoting it. When was the last time you saw a classical musician on E! or in People magazine? It isn't taught in public schools anymore, and it isn't presented on TV. When it does appear in film scores, it's often associated with supervillains and serial killers. So classical music does have its challenges. Challenges of visibility and perception with a mass audience, a lack of market clout, branding, and audience attrition, and also a, pre a perceived failure to keep up with the times. And this creates challenges for musicians and composers. One of the greatest of these challenges is how to build a career, carve out a niche, and respond to numerous other musical styles and influences that make up our cultural ecosystem, and in so doing, captivate new audiences. And that's where our guest today, Nare Sol, really strides inspiringly onto the stage as a brilliant example for the future. She was educated at Juilliard and in Paris, took part in master classes in Leipzig, and then came to Toronto where she earned an artist diploma from the Glenn Gould School at the Royal Conservatory of Music. Early on, she decided that a traditional career as a concert pianist wasn't her destined path, and she has distinguished herself uh, instead as a composer of music that draws on an eclectic array of classical, jazz, and popular influences. More to the point, Nare Sol has developed a powerful presence as a YouTuber. From her start in 2017 to today, she's built a large and loyal following, 
and she's traversed a huge range of musical subjects from how to sound like Beethoven to how to write pop music. Her videos are smart, witty, engaging, substantive, and really meaty. Sorry, vegans. Uh, and a whole range of, um, of subjects uh, are presented in a way that is just simply fun. It didn't take me long to get hooked, and I'm sure when you investigate her YouTube channel, it won't take you long either. Nare, welcome to the Gould Standard. Thank you, Brian, for having me. I'm excited to talk about some very interesting topics with you. Well, and thank you for the intro. Oh, that's fine. It's very elaborate and, and flattering. Thank you. Well, it's, um, it's kind of, uh, I went on at greater than usual length because I really wanted to put what you've achieved in a context. And while a lot of us who have been working in and around classical music for a long time keep wondering, you know, what's the future and how can really interesting new creative careers be built, you've actually gone and done it. So can you tell me a little bit about your own journey? What led you from uh, a very elite classical piano education to your discovery of a, an entirely new way to express yourself musically via YouTube? Well, I, I went across uh, m many different schools following the traditional, quote unquote, traditional path. I started off in different conservatories, studying piano performance. And I always thought that I would become a concert pianist. And I was very comfortable following the guidelines that my mentors and teachers reiterated to me and the, the, the path that I saw a lot of my colleagues take, doing auditions, competitions. But pretty much nearing my, at the end of my bachelor's studies at Juilliard, I started to feel a sense of fatigue combined with just this overwhelming uncertainty of what's to come because I started to, to really look around, not just focus on the repertoire and my tasks for that month, but just to wonder, okay, what am I supposed to do after? And I really had no answers. And the best I could do at that point was to just try to hone in on what is it that excites me about music enough that despite these looming challenges, both circumstantially, logistically, financially associated with this career, I am very adamant about continuing my path as a musician. And I started to narrow it down to a few things that honestly were a little farther away from the stage than I had previously thought. A lot of this included composition. I love music history. I love analyzing music. I was starting to get more into music theory, and yet I didn't know how to organize this or really make sense of it because all I knew at that point was, okay, you practice these pieces and you perfect them for the stage and you focus on the repertoire and, and inter interpretation. So the first thing I did was just explore different avenues, and I, I started to study a little more composition abroad. I also just on my own, in my own very disorganized way, document what I was doing. Because I think being a millennial and just being familiar with things like YouTube and the internet, I already had a culture built into me and that I was familiar with and comfortable plugging into of sharing videos, whether it's, hey, you know, to my friends, I just went to this concert, you know, here's some pictures, here's a video footage. I just took that into the practice room and also just some things that were going on in my head of analyzing this material. And I lumped it together and I started posting it. And this was around 2017. Um, and that just, you know, long story short, <laughs> a lot of, there are a lot of different details in there, but long story short, that started to become a thing that I recognized as having a space in the vast, vast field of um, music on the internet. And what's interesting is that you're, you're able to find your own audience based on your very unique sets of interests and what, what combines together when you make something original. And I just started to see a little bit of momentum in terms of an audience and also communication. I found an audience that I never thought I would have. And actually, I was told that I would never have because I, um, actually in school, a lot of my teachers would say, 
you know, you're not focused enough. You need to focus on one thing and you need to really have discipline in that. And so I, I always thought that I needed to shape more of that into a disciplined figure in order to have an audience. But there was an audience that was interested in someone making their own music, performing, talking about technique one day, music history another day. And that's, that's how I'm doing what I'm doing today. Right. And, and you've actually spoken a little bit about, you know, both the good things of your, you know, your time in the formal academic world, specifically, I think, your Juilliard experience where, you know, they had rigor and they had intensity and they had you know, a very collegial environment, which is great because, you know, you sometimes hear about a very competitive environment and, and it sounds like that wasn't your experience. Um, but also that there are certain things that are really part of the practical reality of a musician that they don't really cover very much. You know, they help you to become a fine musician, but they don't really give you much insight in terms of building a career, you know, other than maybe, you know, go sign up for a lot of competitions. And then, you know, if you win, you'll have a career, which I think is less and less true nowadays than it used to be. So, um, in a way, that gap was one that you sort of, you know, found your own answer to. Um, but is, is it something that you think conservatories should spend more time on? And really, do they understand the challenges enough themselves? That's a very important question. And I've, I've talked about it recently to the public through my videos. And I have mixed it's a complicated subject, so I have mixed opinions about it. Of course, my main stance is that, yes, conservatories should, and I wish they can spend a little more time and energy focusing on that career aspect of things, because even though it's not at the core of why we're doing music and what music is all about, it, it's, it's so relevant to a musician's experience and a musician's ability to actually be a musician in the real world. How is that going to work out if, if you are an incredible musician, but there's no way to sustain that for yourself and there's no way for you to plug into any kind of system to keep it going. So um, yes, I understand that, let's say two to four years, even six years at a music conservatory, the immense amount of information and skill and experience that that a musician needs to just scrape the surface of mastering your instrument is, is you know, too too much to fit into that time period, and the 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 primary focus should be on the craft. But I think um, just a portion of it could be um, catered to what a musician will go through immediately after school and even during school, because e just because they are in conservatory. I always felt that um, the, the schools sort of assume that you have things set up and there's a, a tremendous amount of, of background struggle that I've experienced and I've seen my friends experience while in school um, that it, it's hard to bring into the picture because you're already overwhelmed with the amount of work that you need to do for school and for your instrument. And so that combined with the stress of actually just trying to learn how to play difficult music, very complex music, and, and dealing with the pressures of the stage. Um, that's a recipe for a lot of mental strain, a lot of confusion, and a lot of, um, a lot of problems that I think are solvable if there, there's just more support and more normalization of, of these topics being um, talked about. Specifically, I've shared um, that something, some areas that I think are worth um, expanding in the, the conservatory bubble is how to adapt with the, the moving landscape of social media and how marketing works, how um, technology plugs into being a musician. All of these things are, are very relevant and they're very important for your career in the practical sense. Even things like trying to set up for a remote session, whether it's recording for someone, doing a podcast, right. or, or performing even remotely nowadays, it requires a lot of minute 
details and skills and, and attention to, you know, <laughs> how, to, how to plug certain things into where and put microphones where that um, I think could, could just use a little more um, time in the curriculum because it, it, it does not require a whole semester's course, but just, no. just sort of a, a life skills, <laughs> yep. practical skills for musicians. And to be fair, there are many conservatories, many music schools out there that I have observed and I've heard that they have classes um, that do cover this. Um, I just think that there can be a little more because despite the efforts, I do get hundreds of messages and I also ask around and this was my experience as well. Um, just a, an outcry of, you know, hey, I don't think this is enough. Um, I'm confused. I'm depressed. I'm scared. I don't think I can actually be a musician despite having gone through years of music school training. And I think right. that's that's a problem. It's a, it's a terrible problem. And, and actually, you know, it's gotten much more elaborate than this. But back in the day, in my record business days, you know, my partner and I, and I had many conversations about how, you know, young musicians would come out of conservatory and have no instruction on how to make a record. You know, mm -hmm. you think something so basic, you know, you give concerts, you make records, you do interviews and you promote yourself. And of course you learn repertoire and you practice. That's a large part of, of the musician's life. And that one really key element, and of course recordings used to be, you know, especially if you could get on a label, uh, a more central piece of, of what it took to, to get ahead. And they had never, you know, been through the experience of, you know, doing multiple takes, you know, doing inserts, um, you know, working on getting the sound. And you still to this day, of course, see a lot of um, young musicians in conservatory. And what they have to show the outside world of their work is a friend with a phone sitting in the 28th row when they're doing their, you know, their senior recital. And right. the sound is awful. The image is awful. The, the camera is moving. It's terrible. So, I mean, these are things that aren't that hard. And compared to the cost of their, of their conservatory tuition, the equipment that they need is, you know, is dead cheap, you know, certainly a lot cheaper than, you know, when I was in the, in the music business. Um, so, you know, why not help, help, um, the students make that that transition because they're right. going to go out into the world one day and, you know, we don't want them to all end up as cab drivers right. or Uber right. drivers. I just think that there's, uh, when I observe even online, um, seeing so many different videos and things that people are posting, there is a big gap between what you just described, you know, the friend at the, the senior recital with the phone <laughs> Um capturing your performance versus the highly professional symphony orchestra with the soloist, um, you know, the, the fanciest, the fanciest equipment, everything very, very formal. Um, and I'd like to just see a little more of that middle ground and, and not to say that that doesn't exist. There are so many budding musicians that are becoming hip to the times and they're very good at utilizing all the resources available to them. Um, but compared to maybe some other genres and other cultures of music, I do notice that that, that middle area is, is yet to um, have a bigger presence on the internet. And I think it's because a lot of up and coming classical musicians, they're very busy trying to figure out all that is music and, and trying to, to, um, to really focus on that for good reason. And, um, and that's, that's what they should be doing, but that it, there's a cruel reality to how fast paced and how different the attention span of, of today's audience is and is becoming more and more so because of also the age difference um, and the diff uh, the just transformation of who the audience members will be in the next 10 to 20 years and what cultures they're coming from. So it, it's, a, it's, it's tough <laughs> and I'm definitely a part of it. I see it. 
I'm on, I think I'm on the older spectrum of that just because I uh, went to school just before social media and all of that really took off. Um, but, but the fact is that classical musicians, they don't need to compete with commercial musicians, but there's an element where they're, they're still um, joining the same stage. There, there are overlaps and that's where it becomes tricky. Right, absolutely. And one of the things that I think is really actually very encouraging and hopeful is the hard lines that used to exist in the past between, you know, people's musical tastes as listeners are somewhat breaking down. And we can maybe um, consider the streaming environment as part of what's helped that along. You know, if you hear it and you like it, you know, who cares whether it was written two weeks ago you know, is like some heavily multi-tracked, you know, pop uh, song from, you know, from, you know, L.A. or Nashville, um, or who was written 350 uh, years ago. No one cares as long as they like it. Absolutely. Yeah. And also these days, I think platforms like Spotify, do you use Spotify? Uh, yeah, sure. Or um, or, or other streaming services, I think they're, again, I'll, I'll use the word, this word a lot, they're tricky <laughs> because while they open up so many, many ear doors <laughs> to, to people to find different types of classical artists, classical musicians, because there's so much available on there, it, it invites this passive listening culture that I think um, leaves little room for people to just stop and and pay attention to what they're listening to. I noticed this for myself as well, not just with classical music, but any any playlist or any stream of music that I'm listening to, I tend to turn it on. And because it's not curated like a radio program where there are pauses, let's say every four or five pieces, um, you know, the host will let you know what you were just listening to, maybe a little bit about it. Yep. There's none of that. It just keeps going. And I just noticed that there's a lot of music that I listen to that I, I actually don't know who wrote it and who the artist behind it is. I just, but I am very familiar with the music. And I'm not sure if this is a common uh, experience for a lot of people, but I'm actually rather new to Spotify. I only started using it about two years ago. And um, it's something that I just observed. And, right. and I think it's harder for classical musicians because there's another element of, of credit because it's not just the original composer playing the music or the producer. Um, you could hear the same piece uh, played by hundreds of different instrumentalists, artists. And um, how many times will you actually stop and check out, oh, who, which pianist is playing this, um, this piece? And I, I, just, I just find that a little, uh, it's just an observation that I made recently. Yeah, well, it, it's true. And you, you don't uh, get anything without giving something up. So, you know, the world of streaming basically is great for um, what I call you know, very broad browsing, but not very good for depth. Um, so, you know, if, for example, I mean, you know, I'm ancient, so I, I come from a different tradition. But, you know, when people got interested in, let's say, Beethoven, you know, we would listen to many different artists' performance of the same piece of music to see the range of different expressive ideas, how to handle phrasing, tempi, you know, um, the balance between, you know, outer and inner voices, you know, dynamic, I mean, all the things that go to make performance. And that was really, really intriguing and fascinating. And actually, um, at, to me at least, added an enormous amount to, to my listening experience, my um, engagement with a piece of music. It was a, a deeper dive into a single piece. Obviously, in the world of Spotify, unless there's a playlist that, you know, where there's a an algorithm that, that curates, you know, uh, you know, twelve different performances of the same piece, 
you but you do find that on YouTube. I mean, there are people who do that and, and put those kinds of comparisons together. Um, but in the streaming world, it's great for people to hear something that they've never heard before and decide, um, you know, without bias, hey, I kind of like it. Who, you know, who is that? The question is, do they then decide to go and explore more deeply? And of course, since the world of listening on a physical a physical object, you know, those things, is going the way of the dodo. I mean, you know, I still have my, my CD collection. I even have my LP collection. You know, I'm so old that I'm now trendy again because I have an LP <laughs> collection, you know. Um, I, I did get rid of my 78s. Uh, but anyway, the, the, you, you really raise a very interesting point. And how to coax people who discover something. I mean, let's say that, you know, somehow, you know, the algorithm decided that, you know, you would get a, a bit of, I don't know, Tchaikovsky to listen to. Uh, even if, you know, what you normally listen to is very emo pop music. I don't know whether that actually happens, but anyway, um, you know, do people then say, you know, I'm going to go and find out who this Tchaikovsky guy is because I've never heard of him before. Like, did he, you know, did he write for Broadway, you know, or... <laughs> Or, or, you know, is he, uh, you know, is he uh, someone who, who, who was a winner on American Idol or like, you know, where, where is he from? <laughs> reality TV. Yeah, reality TV. Exactly. So uh, anyway, we, well, we've, we've gotten off on an interesting track, um, but it, it's also interesting that you, um, you decided pretty early on. Uh, before you actually started, you know, going out and trying to find managers and, you know, doing a lot of competitions um, that you wanted to explore a different area. What, how hard was it to decide composing would be a, a big part of your, of your future life? It wasn't a hard decision as it, as much as it was um, confusing to to land on because I was kept I was I was constantly pulled a different direction and um I think at the end of the day I, I always knew I just kept questioning um what I was doing because um I was pretty much on my own with that transition mm -hmm. um Circumstantially, I had some people around me, uh, close teachers at the time, that were very, um, very not supportive of that. I'll put it that way. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and uh, to to be fair, on the flip side, I had um, teachers and and mentor figures that were the opposite. Were very encouraging of me. Um, but at a certain at that age in my early 20s, mid 20s, um, it's, it's hard to not seek the approval of those that you've, you've looked up for, to for advice for many, many years. So it's really hard to break that, that, uh, that relationship and also make that shift. And in some ways, um, the, the fact that some uh, teachers were not supportive of me and um, I, I, I had a hard time about that. It made it easier for me to shift over and, and just say, you know, I actually do need to find people that are more supportive of uh, my interests and um, what I'm going for. And at, uh, throughout all of this, I do understand that it, it's very tricky because it is not a piano teacher's um, responsibility to to. to help you find a different path right, that's right, not right. piano. So, right. so that, that was a bit tricky. Um, transitioning from piano performance to more composition is also a bit different because I, I was used to a different process of finding work, of presenting myself as a, a, a performer, as a musician, as a, as a pianist, and sharing different performances that I've done, different recordings. How do you actually do that for composition before you get a commission? So there's a bit of a catch-22. Um, and I think YouTube helped a lot in that sense because I was just able to open up 
hey, you know, I'm spending the next few months exploring this concept and th these elements and these cultures, and I'm going to uh, incorporate them into my compositions, things like that. Um, but it was not the, the, the smoothest transition. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I, in a way, I think that you may have accidentally done yourself a big favor in terms of you know, finding your voice as a composer to not have that much institutional guidance, because I think there is still to this day a little bit of a, you know, a tendency in the academic compositional world to direct people in a certain, let's say, post-dodecaphonic kind of direction. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. um, and what I think is really wonderful and refreshing about your music is how many different influences musically you've absorbed, not only composers of the past who, you know, you've spoken about your love of them. Like, you know, I mean, I hear little resonances of Eric Satie in some of your pieces. Um, and, um, but also, you know, uh, non-classical. And I've always felt that it was really, really um, valid to draw upon non-classical music in a classical context, just the way in the 19th century with the, the rise of nationalism, um, composers drew upon folk music. You know, it is part of the musical ecosystem that we're all part of, and it's simply a way of of treating it as as you know, kind of the raw materials to to have a different kind of expression. Definitely, and that's why I love to take influence from of so many different sources. And there's always something new to find in things that you that are old. Uh, just because you you ha yourself have not discovered them, and there are new ways to incorporate them into the music. Right. And part of um, the the current contemporary classical classical music culture, I think, still relies on um, putting a, a ton of importance on b something being novel. Like we've never heard this before. And this is, it's never been as complex as this. Um, and while that pushes uh, many elements of music forward, um, I think it's not the end all be all of, of what makes what new music worthy of, of listening to and all that. Absolutely. I mean, uh, it's really interesting. There, there used to be way back in the 1950s, a, classical radio commentator who just called himself de Coven. And I've heard some recordings of him, and he would basically go on at great length about how um, he considered what he called the Barococo, Baroque and Rococo uh, period, to be the sort of supreme uh, pinnacle of Western classical music because it focused on excellence of craft rather than novelty of expression. And... Um, uh, I would not fully endorse that because clearly if music is going to change rather than always stay in the same place, you do need novelty. But at a certain point where um, you see in the 20th century, for example, you know, some really wonderful composers who wrote beautiful and expressive music, um, but they weren't necessarily on the, you know, 12 tone or aleatoric or whatever, you know, uh, trend the academic co compositional world was embracing at that moment, you know, they would be dismissed. You know, let's say, you know, a relatively conservative composer like the American Howard Hansen, who wrote many symphonies and a lot of beautiful work. Um, well, no one really took him that seriously. And, and lots and lots of other composers beside found themselves in that sort of, you know, off the mainstream path, you know, that the you know, the Schoenbergs and the Bulezes and the, you know, Stockhausens and, you know, so on and so forth. You know, they were sort of the, the, the academically approved. And, uh, and I, I think that's breaking down now because to a certain extent, being academically approved is kind of like, you know, uh, saying, oh, so you don't have an audience. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, the thing that I was um, thinking about just now as you were saying that is is uh, how composers like Percy Granger um, are, are perceived with 
before you even really get to know the the extent of his output um, a certain way just because um, the the academic that um, institutionalized side of things uh, relate to his compositional approach is is not as strong as um, as other fields right um, just to just to be conservative of of not you know, overstating anything here. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and in fact, you know, to be fair, while, you know, a lot of um, institutional energy was, you know, um, saying what is and isn't the approved, you know, future of music direction, you know, millions and millions of listeners were still embracing, you know, Vaughn Williams and Sibelius and, you know, composers who really were, you know, much more firmly rooted in tradition, uh, and yet found a, a way of of, um, of um, exploring an authentic personal voice. Um, and of course, Schoenberg himself once said, um, "There's still a lot of great music to be written in C major." So, you know, definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean, any and all systems work, whether they're tried and tested and extremely traditional and conservative or they've never been done be used before and no one has seen this and it's highly intellectually complex they will all work if um if it's driven by something very human and yeah. i think ultimately when you're experiencing it as a human being will be drawn to a, a, so many different types of music but there's there's something um that will plug into some portion of the the human human experience, the yeah. the range of emotions that we're capable of identifying and and feeling. Um, but when it it becomes a matter of principle, we're going to write and present music in this way because it it's it's meant to be designed as such to conform to very uh, intellectual and, and institutionalized standards. That can exist. There's an audience for that. I, yes. you know, there's an audience for everything. But it, it, there's a ceiling to that, in my opinion. Right. Well, I would say the, um, the this is the only way mindset is definitely a dead end, even if some of the music that is created by people who may have it may be actually very interesting and very good. Um, I like your system, which I think I would describe as the sponge system, where you absorb just about <laughs> everything, um, and then find a way of of filtering it through your own creativity to, to achieve your personal voice. And and I have to say, you know, um, well, we'll get into a, a little bit of of uh, about some of your specific pieces and also your 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 first album. But um, let's let's turn back to your YouTube channel uh, first. Um, when was your when did you you post your first video in in what is now the the Nare Soul um uh channel? I believe it was summer of 2017. Uh -huh. And was in, in, when you did it was it I'm starting a channel or I have a, a a video that I think is kind of fun and I I think I'll just put it up there. The latter. Uh -huh. It it was a mixture of um having having enough time to actually put together a video and I, I definitely don't take that for granted and I, I recognize that at that period I had time <laughs> and and I had access to a beautiful piano I was really excited about my new dog I adopted a dog recently at that time and any dog owners will know that you know I couldn't take enough pictures and videos of him. And of course, he was always so cute next to me on my lab while practicing. And I wanted to capture a lot of this. And it was also the first summer I was without a piano teacher. And I was completely left to my own device to practice what I wanted, spend my hours at the piano in whatever fashion I wanted. And I was aware that I was doing things that was highly unstructured. And just to give a little bit of a framework, I decided that I would sort of self-monitor uh, by filming certain parts of, of my work. 
And I love handling cameras. I have a little bit of a background working also as a freelance photographer um, prior to that, that year. And I'm just very interested in visual arts. So to me, the idea of compiling this footage into something, um, however sloppily done, uh, and posting it was something very fun and interesting to me. I, I think after a handful, maybe half a dozen, I started to get a little more creative with how I was filming as well. Um, but I did not post any of those videos thinking, okay, this is now my YouTube channel. <laughs> and there was not that much of a culture of having uh, a YouTube channel as a, as a uh, budding musician as much, especially in, in my circle. Um, I may not be aware of certain um, certain musicians that were already doing this as a you know YouTube channel, and I'm I'm a classical musician, but um, I was certainly an anomaly again uh, amongst my friends. Um, but it was most importantly just fun. And how quickly did you start to see that people were were glomming onto this and and starting to follow your work? Um, it was not very quick at all. In fact, there was not much of a change for months. Basically, the, whoever was watching was the people that I was friends with from school and my family. Um, and there is one video that got a lot of attention on Facebook ah, during that time. Which one was that? And it was um, improvising in the styles of different ca classical composers over Mary Had a Little Lamb. Ah. And I was definitely not uh, a, a seasoned or experienced improviser in, in that realm. And, and still to this day, what I w was, uh, what I meant to do basically was just to poke fun and, and just have a little bit of a, a, a joking, um, in a joking way, right. <laughs> a, a, a video where I, try to emulate the, the essence of a, a composer style in bits, in little fragments with Mary Had a Little Lamb, right. um, almost just making fun of them <laughs> right. just for a laugh. And that um, got many views all of a sudden. And um, from there, I think a little bit of my online presence started to form and I started to get a lot of Know, attention and, and messages from different creators that were already doing YouTuber. And that's when I met a lot of um, friends that are I'm still close with today mm -hmm. who encouraged me to um, post these videos uh, more on YouTube than on Facebook. Because at right. the time, I would, it was sort of inconsistent as well. I would post most things on Facebook, but also occasionally on YouTube. Mm -hmm. and um, And so... I started to then shift over to YouTube and, and post more on there. Interesting. And, and uh, mm -hmm. just to give people an idea of how things have progressed in what I guess is now four and a half years or so, um, you have how many subscribers? I have 450,000. That's pretty amazing. On That's YouTube. pretty amazing. And um, the total number of views, roughly speaking... That I don't know, actually. <laughs> okay. Well, I've seen 22 million. Yeah. Uh, I, have, I don't know. Uh, across, I have um, maybe close to 200 videos now. Yeah. Um, I, it's, I, I don't keep track of the specific numbers, but um, yeah, all across YouTube, right. the, the, number, the numbers do add up. Yep. And, and, but it's uh, also been many years. <laughs> right. Well, four and a half years, you know, Depending on where you are in life, four and a half years is many years or not so many years. So, uh, but okay, um, I'll, I'll take it. It's uh, it's been many years, but you've built a real audience now. And what I love about the channel and what really has kind of hooked me on it is that you deal with such a wide range of musical subjects, you know, and that you don't really compromise. I mean, you will go into the into the weeds and the depths, in, but in a very very concise way. Um, some of your videos seem pitched to professionals and serious music students, 
but it, it never feels like inside baseball. You know, it's it's always fun and very accessible. And um, you know, there are um, musical adventures that anyone can enjoy, like your exploration of how you know the classics sound on a toy piano. I thought that was that was really brilliant. And, uh, and you still have the toy piano? Did was that a major? I do. Invest, was that a major investment? That 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 was. I I I felt a little bit of sweat when I bought it because I, I had no business buying a toy piano when I did, and I didn't need one. And I just fell in love with this toy piano. Uh huh. And uh, I just it it was honestly uh, a very spontaneous purchase, and I just thought I need a toy piano. Um, and I got it and I had it shipped over to me. Uh-huh. Um, and I was, I was most interested in, in that, um, the quarter inch jack yes. where that allows you to record it directly. And, and I've never seen they have, something like they that, have that They have that in a toy piano. In the one that I bought, and that's the why, that's the reason I got it. Because Amazing. The thing about to- yeah, the thing about toy pianos is that they're, they're so, uh, quirky yeah and that's part of their charm but it's hard to capture all of the the small details in, in the sound that it's producing because there are um mechanical things that are happening because a lot of these instruments they're they're just uh they're just odd <laughs> the yes, way yes, that yes, you yes. have to play them the key the mechanism and so a lot of that sound which is also characteristic characteristically part of um, the toy piano sound, but it overpowers the actual pitches and what's going on inside. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times when I hear recordings of toy piano, the the, the touch and the, the clacking of the keys and the actual instrument, the sound is too uh, overpowering. Right, right, right. And I, I really always want to, uh, I wish that I can listen to uh, what's happening inside as well. And that balance is just so hard to to um, to find because you you know you also don't want it it so that you don't hear the instrument because right. then that sounds fake. Um, but the fact that I can just plug it into the instrument, I can hear the little details, and I just I just liked it. Um, yes, and, but, and and I guess it's uh, it would be a little silly to get into the, the you know like the kind of conversations you have about grown-up pianos like you know is the action fast or a little slow yeah. is it you know yeah. does it need to be regulated yeah. you know should, yeah, we get a, should we get a technician in to, to give it a going over maybe do a little voicing right it's very liberating because on that toy piano um there are i think i mean most of the the keys are already out of tune characteristically but, <laughs> right um but there are two on the top end that a lot of people also commented about that are just really off, <laughs> but but it's liberating because you just accept it. You just know this is the instrument, and you embrace it. And when you play it and record it, that's just characteristically a part of this instrument. And so I like that, and yeah. I like playing playing with how um, even when I was recording that video, there there are certain things that. I just couldn't get the the keys to do, and sometimes I would play it um, exactly the way that I played it, and it would sound. And I would redo it in that same way, um, and it, it would it would sound a different way because yep. of some repetitive function or whatever was happening inside. And so um, it's it's you, you really have to just be gentle with it and, and right. <laughs> accept it's. The weirdness. Yep. Well, f- well, friends, you've just learned more about the toy piano than probably you ever thought you would ever you would ever have the chance to, or would ever want to. Uh, so <laughs> there we go. But oh, don't don't tell that to John Cage fans. No, 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 absolutely not. And 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 by the way, it's a really really great video. So I highly recommend it because oh, you. you also rate how some of the major classics fare on the toy piano like do they sound really convincing and you had a kind of a meter that you developed for that it's it's really great you also um uh did a video where you created classical accompaniments accompaniments to a billy eilish song um have you have you heard heard anything from billy about how she liked the accompaniments (laughs) no no um 
No, but I did do that video and um, the, really the, the way that I come up with these ideas and mixture of ideas, not only is it I'm going to make a video using the toy piano or I'm going to make a video about Billie Eilish's music. Um, I like to combine different things that I'm curious about at any given time. And the way I land on the final version of the video is sometimes very chaotic. And it, it's, it's a direct representation of the thought process that I have um, while listening to something or writing music. And one thing leads to another little question, which leads to another, you know, aha moment, which then sparks, you know, many different um, further questions. And, and so, for example, you know, why I chose to do famous melodies and then rate them. Um, I, I just, to me at that time, um, combining those elements was more interesting and, and to me just fun than to sit down and listen to those famous pieces in the original form um, and recordings of them and rating them. So I just have a lot of fun with, with concepts like that. <laughs> Well, one of the one of the most interesting series you have a, a number of what I'd call subset series in in on your channel are the how to sound like various composers uh, ones, and you've done Beethoven and Chopin. Your Satie is my favorite because I love Satie, um, and it really is a great way to approach um, an understanding of musical style. You know, um, most of us, um, I think kind of experience music fairly casually. So we have a, 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 an emotional reaction. Most of us, I think, are focused on the melody, um, even though the melody without its harmonic surroundings and structure is usually pretty, pretty uh, empty. Um, and this is really a chance to look under the hood and show kind of the, the genius ways that... Um, that these composers found of using the elements of musical structure and language to create ultimately an emotional effect. It's a, it's a way to, to look under the hood, so to speak, and see what's going on and why it's affecting you the way it is. Um, did a lot of that stem directly from your original training, or is it something that you've kind of pulled together from your own explorations of the composers and their 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 um and your own sort of getting deeper and deeper into into how they did what they did definitely the latter um i think i i i do remember many moments during piano lessons and in school where um, the topic of a composer's style or something that's recurring in their compositions when that came up i would kind of perk up and, and be curious and just think, just wonder, yes, that's right. You know, I always hear Rachmaninoff doing that, but what, what, what is it? And yet it was never really, I never leaned into this, nor was it um, an area of focus in, in my training. Um, but I, in general, really love uh, learning about the behind the scenes and the inner workings of how something is made, whether it's a piece of technology or bread. You know, I like going to, you know, those um, uh, certain restaurants and, and bakeries where they show you, you know, they have the open window, they show how, how the bread is being made, prepared in the back and the machinery. And I just appreciate what I'm experiencing as a final product, as a final experience, a lot more when I know what, what's um, what goes on in in the in the background in order to make that. So I just wish, as someone that is is playing music that's written hundreds of years ago, um, there there's a way that that can be shown as as uh, fraudulently and um, imaginatively uh, as it is as if the composer was saying you know this was not what I was thinking of this is what I was cooking up and I am very very aware <laughs> of the limitations of trying to fit in uh, 
describing a composer's style and the history of everything in what, seven to 15 minutes, <laughs> how ridiculous that is and how, uh, you know, how pretentious can you be to say, okay, I'm going to teach you all today how to sound like J.S. Bach. Um, but that limitation aside and just leaning into the absurdity of it, it allows us to just play in this little sandbox and say, okay, I'm going to imagine um, building, I'm going to break apart this music and show you what I think are some important elements of this music. And then we're going to build it back up and we're just gonna imagine um, how a composer would have done it yeah, back it, in his day. It, and, it, exactly, exactly. And by the way, if they were around, they'd probably be really mad because you know the magician never reveals their, their, their tricks, <laughs> right? But I think- so Not only would they be mad, they would, they would just laugh and say, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you are well, so off. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I think that you're, you're um, first of all, a lot of these really, they, it's, it's rewarding to, to watch them a couple of times because things go by pretty quickly, you know, especially the little graphics, you know, like, you know, <laughs> plagal movement, you know, uh, in, <laughs> in the Satie, for example. Um, and they two, flash, two seconds. Two seconds. Yes, exactly right. So, uh, but the other thing is, um, it really conveys the idea that, you know, like when you listen to Chopin, Chopin, his music makes you feel a certain way. It, obviously, you know, a wide range of different emotions depending on the piece, but there is a certain signature that everyone can kind of recognize if they've listened to, you know, eight or ten different Chopin pieces that will, you know, when they hear the next one, they'll say, oh, that's Chopin. Uh, and it's got that that feeling. And it isn't that there's a Chopin kind of tune or melody necessarily, although that could be the case in, in, for certain composers. It's everything they do to build up that, you know, that the melody, the development of the melody, the counter melodies, the, the use of you know, the mm -hmm. sonata form, et cetera, et cetera, to, and being able to understand that it makes you feel that way for a reason, and that's where the art really is, um, I think that's really, really valuable because it changes your mm -hmm. relationship to music and how you listen to it. And it also, Definitely. it also makes the reward of listening carefully, which is, mm -hmm. you know, where the real, the real beauty and power, which by the way, goes against the whole streaming Spotify approach where right, you just right. sort of, you know, <laughs> right. You know, I'm just here as a passive agent, uh -huh. you know, music, just come and get me, do what you will to me. I'm, I'm just, you know, you're in the background and, you know, you know, take me off to dreamland. Well, you know, this is right. actually a much more active listener role, which I think you're yeah. really doing a lot to encourage. Thank you. And, and that, that's, that means a lot to me because I actively seek to try to, um, try to help people listen to different parts of, of the music. And in that way, they're, they're really a part of the whole experience more than, um, just observing it and and they're an active part in shaping how how they're experiencing it emotionally. And I've seen that sort of transformation happen um, in in different um, settings, whether it was in front of um, you know a group of kids that I, I'm showing doing a little presentation and they don't seem as interested in settee. They think it's boring, you know, it's so slow and and then I, I start to invite um, them to pay attention to, you know, isn't that harmonic change there? Doesn't that make you feel a certain way? Or doesn't that make you feel uh, feel the mystery of something? Or, or uh, invite them to start imagining uh, different things that, that, that require their active participation. And then um, as they're, they're, listening to the same music in different ways while thinking about different ways and being challenged to, um, you know, put different elements of things together in their head, they start to appreciate the music more. And in no time, they don't think the music is boring and slow <laughs> and they're, they're, they're interested. And, and, you know, I, I've, I've seen enough of this, um, in, in so many different settings that I, I am very convinced that, the, the, all this music out there is so good. It doesn't need that much help. 
but just a little tiny bit of help goes a long way in just showing people um, the, the beauty behind it and the depth of um, emotions behind the music and and how it taps into things that maybe we're not even aware of day to day because you know it, it's it's easier and better um, and just more practical not to experience the full range of human emotion every day because right. then your life would <laughs> become very chaotic very soon well maybe um, but maybe you know, it's also maybe not. <laughs> well it's I, you know i don't i don't know i mean i i think that in some ways the kind of social order that we live in does discourage us from exploring the 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 depth of our emotions as fully as as might have been acceptable earlier but i also think it's a question of time people are just driven off their mm -hmm. feet to keeping up with everything and the you know to do the kind of active listening you're talking about means you know i mean for me it's i put my get myself alone in a quiet room, the phones will not disturb me. Um, I turn down the lights and I listen in a focused way that basically excludes everything else from my consciousness, which is not something that you can really turn on easily. You actually have to practice to get to that point. But it's also the kind of music listening that makes you feel so much better, so mm -hmm. much more, you know, not just refreshed, but almost like, you know, all the negativity of a day is purged out of your system mm -hmm. when you, when you can do that. That's, uh, that's very um, interesting to me to, to hear about your listening setup. Is mm -hmm. that something that you landed uh, upon consciously or just over time you, you realize that you like turning off the lights and, you like it's uh, listening in a certain way. Well, actually, it's um, it goes back to when I was in high school, and I would actually, I, I I've always had a very odd relationship with sleep. I regard sleep as a kind of a a, a necessary evil that that keeps you from doing all the things you want to do for the rest with the rest of your time. And there used to be a um, a classical music program, um on the radio in Toronto um, that started at two in the morning. So I would listen to it for about an hour between two and three with headphones. Um, and I found that the, um, even if I fell asleep, the moments leading up to falling asleep, um, it was a very powerful and intimate relationship with the music. And there was nothing else to distract me because it was two or 2.30 in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and you could basically not be thinking about, you know, how you were feeling physically um, because you were basically able to create a, um, a sonic environment that, a, that eliminated everything else. Wow. I, I, think, that's, I, I think that's incredible that you um, not only recognize that, but you, you found a way to recreate that and be a part of your lifestyle now. And it's not, it's not really, it's not very common to, to have a very specific setup for listening. And I, and I, um, I asked you about it because it's, it's something that I'm, I'm aware of for myself even too, because I used to have different time uh, periods th throughout my week where all I'm doing is listening to music and, and it's usually for a specific purpose. Maybe I'm doing research on something or I'm just really um, just waiting to listen to an album in its entirety uh, in an undistracted way. Um, but more and more as my schedule got busier, I noticed that I'd be listening to music in so many odd places. And it's because nowadays, um, even though the sound quality suffers so much, again, going back to things like Spotify, I'm, I'm listening with my earbuds on the go. Um, when I was living in New York, I'd listen to music on the subway until I realized, you know, it's really too loud to listen to music on the subway, even with noise canceling devices. And then uh, when I moved to the West Coast, 
I realized that I was listening to the music most when I'm driving. And, and that's a very specific type of environment. Even though I, I love it, it there's, there's always this rumbling that <laughs> adds into the music. Absolutely. And, and honestly, the, I, I'm not suggesting that the kind of very, very intently focused listening that I'm talking about is the only way. Like music can be enjoyed at so many different levels, including the most casual. You know, I've never been one of those people who turns up my nose at, you know, dinner music or, you know, even, you know, cocktail piano. In fact, there, I don't know whether you, you know this piece, um, but uh, the American composer Michael Doherty, I don't know if you're familiar with his music, no. but he uses pop. He was uh, a student of Ligeti, and he, mm -hmm. but his thing is, is that he uses popular culture element as his main inspiration. And mm -hmm. when he was studying uh, with Ligeti, he basically, you know, paid his way by being a cocktail pianist. And he created this piece called Lounge Lizards, which is basically about, you know, being a pianist in a cocktail lounge. And it's hilariously funny. Um, but, you know, I'll check it out. there's music. Yeah, there's music for all those those Different. kinds of contexts. But, you know, I mean, honestly, please do not try the kind of listening that I'm talking about while driving because you will definitely have an accident. No, 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 no. I just think that there, there's tremendous value in in curating a space if if you're a music lover music yep. loving to listen to music um and it it's it's worth doing it um, it requires a commitment but for example you know i mean and anyone who who has lost track um especially if you can get to a place with a good sound system. I don't want to make it sound like it's you know you have to have a lot of expensive equipment but one of the reasons mm -hmm. that you know in the past, you know, um, lots and lots of kids, you know, their first major purchase, even before they bought their car, was to buy a good mm -hmm. sound system, you know, or mm -hmm. a pretty good mm -hmm. sound system, what they could, you know, afford to buy from their summer jobs. And, you know, they would mm -hmm. dro drop 500 or 750 or $1,000 to get a decent pair of speakers, a nice turntable, and, you know, a what they used to call a receiver, which was an amplifier, preamplifier, and, and radio tuner in one unit. And, that would, first of all, give you a realistic enough sonic experience that you could begin to get a little closer to the music. You know, when I had my record label, my partner was a brilliant sound engineer, and our goal was to make the best sounding records in the world. Whether we succeeded or not is, you know, a matter of opinion, but we certainly worked very hard at it. And we, because we wanted it to have that kind of immersive impact for people. And, um, so, but it it requires a commitment to your um, listening with music to basically say, you know, this is my time, you know, and even if it's the same piece of music and you listen to it ten times in a row, you'll hear something different. You'll begin to yeah. hear the different parts. You'll be able to isolate out, you know, what's going on at this moment. What happened in the harmony just there? What? How did the instrumentation change in that? from that place to that, what was the key change that, and why did it work so well with the, the song lyric, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Or if it's a, a, as in a lot of classical music, purely instrumental, you know, why did that final chord change, even though, you know, we're in the recapitulation where everything is repeating, it's repeating in a different key and it feels different. And so mm -hmm. when it comes to an end, it really feels like it's come to an end. You know, how did, how did that right. happen? You know, uh, so I think that's that's very powerful. And I think, again, what you're doing in your in your videos really helps encourage people in that direction. So you become, you, you know, I think a tremendous ambassador for, well, not just classical music, because you also, you know, I mean, classical music also has this negative reputation for being very snooty about other kinds of music right nothing else is good beside this you know and everything else is trivial or junk or whatever but you really have approached many other kinds of music in a very very respectful way to kind of understand how what the internal dynamics of let's say well flamenco is one that i i i, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed um but you know i think you've done a hip-hop one as well and you know, I think that's also very interesting because it, it helps 
bring the universe of music together under a kind of a common umbrella. We're all, we're all in music. Yes, absolutely. And I appreciate that comment. Um, if you examine very closely and examine enough pieces in classical music repertoire, there's, there are elements of all kinds of music, folk, from folk traditions, um, contemporary music, just so many, um, so many genres that maybe the average stereotypically snooty classical musician might say, um, no, classical, musician, uh, classical music is so much more better and refined. Um, but there are elements and hints of this music embedded into um, the music that they're playing um, right. because the composers were um, maybe like me in some way inspired by elements of these cultures. And so there, it, it's underneath everything, the mixture of cultures and genres and um, threads of traditions and music is, is, um, is all there. And I think um, throughout, just throughout decades and hundreds of years, actually, um, a certain tradition formed that separates classical musician and what's defined as classical musician from um, other, other popular genres. And um, I think it's important to just break free from that. Uh, and, and what, why I do it is because I'm just genuinely curious about how music works in, mm. in other uh, groups and cultures. And um, whenever I come across a, a piece or a track or musicians that, um, that I like, and I'm curious about how, what rhythm are they playing and how, did, how come it sounds this way? I can't really put my finger on what it is, but I, I recognize it. Um, how, how can I do something similar to that? And then um, just because I do this now, I make a video about it. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> now, uh, how, how did your collaboration with PBS come about? You, you were co-host of uh, Soundfield, which is a really yes, terrific program. Um, and I really loved the, the dynamic between you and, and your co-host. Um, Arthur. Uh, yes, Arthur. Um, he's fantastic. He's, he's a... Um, a percussionist in about five different genres, right? Musically speaking, uh, jazz. Oh, uh, so many, yeah. so many. He is such a, a multifaceted artist, and the the whole team at PBS um, they're great because um, the brainstorming sessions for different topics were always so um, so open, and I was I was very um, happy to be a part of that project. How it came about was that they were familiar with my YouTube channel and um, they had that uh, general ideas of a new music show. And um, Arthur and I came on to help form that. Uh, and, and we were part of the first season. He's still a co-host. Um, I'm no longer a co-host since um, I lost track of time. But after 30-something yes. episodes... <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm not very good at at keeping up to date with uh, you know certain mm -hmm. calendar dates and and um, I, I lose track of time very easily. Um, but when I was working with them on on these episodes, uh, it was in many ways what I was doing on my YouTube channel. The big team with more resources and different ways of. Uh, structuring the footage. My strategy for my videos has been and still is uh, kind of very um, improvised in terms of, hey, we're going to take a look at this topic. So right. um, here are the general bullet points of what I want to talk about and what I want to um, just focus on. And then I grab footage just in whatever capacity I can. Um, and then just to tie up the knots at the end, I'll have maybe a more structured um, talking to the camera uh, bit where I just tie the narrative together. But um, it, it was very different for PBS where everything is very scripted and we know what we're going to say and um, who we're going to interview and all of that. 
Right. But it, yeah, that was that was that was a very um, enlightening experience for me to work with a team. Well, I, I thought it was brilliant. And again, Arthur, uh, it's uh, Buckner, right? Arthur. Uh, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, fabulous. And um, and what I loved about about it is, you know, the um, enormous respect that he showed for your music and the enormous respect that you showed for his music, and that really allowed you to cover an enormous amount of territory. By the way, when you were talking about um, your experience with um, with kids um, and bringing music that they're not familiar with to them, you know, next time you're you're in contact with PBS, we do need a new version of the Young People's Concerts that Leonard Bernstein <laughs> used to do, so you should be the host for that. You get my vote. <laughs> Thank you. I think that would be an awesome series, and I think you would be perfect to do it. Thank you. I would love to work more with with kids um, sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just I just love I just love how straightforward they are and how open to many new ideas they are. Right. They're just they're they're truly like sponges. Yeah, absolutely. And th this is actually something that I've I've seen in my own life. You know, particularly during the the time when we were working uh, very closely with El Sistema in South America. And, you know, for people who think that, you know, kids can't get into classical music or any particular kind of music, let's say jazz, um, you see these kids who are learning, you know, to um, beat time to Mozart from the time they're about two or three years old. And by the time they're seven or eight and they're actually picking up a fiddle and learning to play, you know, Ina Klein and music, they adore it. They adore everything else too. They love, you know, uh, rock and salsa and and you know uh, and hip hop and so on. But you know, they they basically are completely open to it. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, I think there's there's room for that. Uh, let me ask you: um, Is there a downside to YouTube and you know an internet focused career generally? You know, the the internet operates on an internal machinery that's built on algorithms, which in a sense tailors what you get recommended to you to what you've shown an interest in previously. So to a certain extent, it it's more oriented towards not encouraging you to branch out into other things, but to continue with the same thing that you've already expressed a preference for. Um, is that something that you sometimes have to kind of work around in order to, you know, build an audience and allow people to discover your 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 work yes definitely and uh, there are so many different challenges to being an internet um internet musician in any capacity especially if you're creating videos that is uh oh this word is so um so loaded content oriented <laughs> content oriented and not just uh, uploading, let's say, performance pieces or original music. Um, you mentioned the algorithm. It's something that, um, well, first of all, the algorithm to me is more than just how a platform organizes their material like YouTube. It's just a representation on people's viewing habits. Um, I don't think it's anything fancier than that, although they're small strategies that you can use to have just just optimize what you can what you, you, you what you what's under your control um, but the fact is that the viewing culture of people is very fickle and people are they they want you to be consistent to what what you created when they discovered you and why they started following you so it's this we want more of that uh, mentality but at the same time because internet culture and just people's attention spans these days is moving so fast um, people are also wanting something new and different on a consistent basis so these two things don't necessarily um, gel well together all the time it's great to have a mixture of it because it, you can do you can definitely do a bit of both but it's it's hard to curate in this way, and um, being the more you're aware of this and of, of people's viewing habits, the more it will be hard to break free from it. As um, a musician, as any creative individual, we're not always in one single mode. 
we're not always wanting to um, focus on a specific topic all the time or a specific angle all the time. It's we're shifting and um, certain things are, are not predictable and hard to confine to a, a, a framework. So as soon as you are aware of this and you understand that it, it pays off to do a video a certain way, package it in a certain way, um, make sure that you, you cover this topic consistently enough throughout the month to then say, you know, according to my musical integrity right now and, and just sticking to what genuinely interests me at this given moment, it does not align with what YouTube theoretically is asking of me. <laughs> and, um, you know, there, I, honestly, for me, there are some times where I say, well, I'm interested in this, so I'm going to do it anyway. Um, and never mind if the, the viewership drops or the internet thing is, is not for that. Um, but it's very hard to do and impractical to be uh, stubborn about that all the time. Because what can all easily happen is that um, internet momentum that you've created is is going to be unstable and um and i think that's very very difficult um as as someone that is trying to do music for music skate sake and make videos for the creative aspect of, about it and also be practically rooted in just the reality of this is now my job and this is how i make a living therefore you know i can't be too um risky about certain things. So anyway, the, the combination of things makes it difficult. Um, I try my best to just keep it balanced so that I'm not ignoring the side of me that wants to branch out and do something very different or do something that I know there's such a limited audience for. Um, because if I don't feed that, I think ultimately I will become depressed <laughs> quite, right, right, right. quite simply. Well, you don't want to stagnate creatively. I mean, it makes me wonder if you think about um, a composer who went through many, many different stylistic phases. Let, let's say Stravinsky, right? So if he had been a YouTuber and he'd had success with, you know, Petrushka and the Firebird, he would have basically committed YouTube suicide by doing the Rite of Spring. He would never have been allowed to go and do things with a jazz influence like L'Histoire de Soldat. He wouldn't have been able to do to go into his neoclassical phase, mm -hmm. and he would mm -hmm. certainly not have been allowed to do 12-tone music at the end of his life. Right, you know? right. So, Definitely. So in a way, there is a kind of a straitjacket downside that uh, mm -hmm. can be... Uh, how well a is getting subscribers people who will actually say you know who are loyal to you and will stick with you part of the solution um and it is diversifying so that you're not only on youtube the other part of the solution i i think subscribers are still important but it's not it's very uh not hardly as important as just the number of views um, I, I think it's best to treat a video as its own separate project, as if it was not tied to a channel with however many subscribers you have. Um, because I just noticed that if, if I bank on the fact that I have a certain amount of subscribers and I'll just assume that a certain guaranteed portion of them will watch the video, um, I, I don't think that uh, it... it the video will actually translate and, and be shown to people because it just doesn't work that way. It's, it's not a fixed thing just because people are subscribed. Um, it's better to just view a video as it's a separate project. Is it interesting to me? Is it interesting to um, a potential view viewer? And is it just a worthy enough topic, um, you know, maybe on the entertaining side of things or the very educational side of things, how, wherever it lies on the spectrum, um, then it's worth pursuing the video. Um, 
but uh yeah this is this i'm glad you asked this question because it's um it's not straightforward at all and there are days when honestly i i do feel very lost um simply put at just handling all of this and and i'm trying to understand how how is this going to work long term because um you, you put it with the best word it's it's almost like a straight jacket sometimes and um and that that side of things um makes youtube very very unsustainable for a lot of musicians and creative individuals in my opinion because it just demands a certain thing from you um that being said there are i think if you find the right audience um there are people that are they go out of the way, their way to support you and make sure that you have that cushion underneath so that you don't have to rely on just the youtube engine and that's why platforms like patreon i use patreon where um i have a group of really generous um individuals that um subscribe to me there and they um give me a little bit of uh financial support each month and that adds up so that i use that as a living to support myself and not not look at youtube as the 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 source of my income because if that were the case i would not be able to eat <laughs> <laughs> well to, youtube you know, is, live yeah youtube has cut down and cut down and cut down how much yes. the the con pardon me the content creators ugh, mm-hmm. um make yeah. I, I hate that too no con- no it, content it, is is what you stuff into a tin can before you God. put the label on it you know i'm really curious how that they they chose uh, and, and landed on the word content um but it, it is true as a content creator um it, it, i don't upload i cannot upload um as often as the youtube engine right. um wants you to upload and there are so many exceptions to all of these soft not rules but right. these um these quirks about the internet and and youtube but from my experience um i i'm i'm best um uh, i put out my best work and i feel the best about my work when i'm not putting out something and uploading just for the sake of consistency just for the sake of showing right. up every week or every however much time yeah when you when you feel a real inspiration or you feel really mm-hmm. excited by a, a topic absolutely mm-hmm. and and obviously you know if this were a nobler and better world than the one we live in that would be enough all by itself and you would never be pressed to to compromise uh and move in a direction other than what you honestly legitimately feel most drawn to right you know there are pros and cons to all of it, it you know th- those are the cons but i i'm able to actually have a career and do what i love yep. because uh i'm able to upload things onto youtube and put my voice out there and put my work out there. Yep. Exactly. And 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 Bach had to write a new cantata every single week for like 5 years in uh, in Leipzig, you know? It, it, the the job of doing the job of making music is also part of being a professional in in the field. Um Absolutely. Do you have a sense of what your audience breakdown is like whether it's because of comments you get like is uh, age um demographic, mm-hmm. geographic um um spread um whether they are diehard classical people or converts or newbies or yeah like who who are the people who are your your listeners I do have a general sense based on what the an- analytical reports show me from from places like YouTube um and Instagram as well but it it's very hard to know for sure. Um and I I think I get more information from comments and emails and different polls that I've put out. Um but the general demographic I would say is um people f- between the ages 20 and 35, mostly in North America. Um 
but different parts of Central Europe, um, some Asia as well, um, Latin America. And in terms of their relationship to music, most are, I would say, not diehard classical fans. They, they're classical music, music appreciators. Um, and they are a small portion are professional musicians and aspiring musicians, m- music students. Um, and, but I think the vast majority are people that work in completely different fields, but they are passionate enough about music as a whole. Maybe not tied to a specific genre even, although I see a lot of jazz and um, I would say jazz is, is maybe the, the biggest tick mark that I see of, of um, favorite genres. And then there's the people that uh, love rock, fusion, um, and and any of the genres that I've covered in my videos, you know, bossa nova, flamenco, hip hop, um, beats. Although I I never actually covered hip hop formally, but anyway, you get the point. Um, it's a mixed bag, and I, I find that interesting because I do put out certain material that is very um, narrowed into the, the classical music, especially pianist um oriented videos and, and and yet people still watch the video so so um i think it's very interesting that there's something there for everybody i guess yeah i i think that those are fascinating even for non-pianists um and I, that was something that i was really curious about myself because mm-hmm. you know it's the kind of thing that someone who is let's say um, if we put it in the Canadian context, let's say doing grade 10 piano at the Royal Conservatory and thinking, you know, do I want to keep doing this? Do I want to go for my, my performance diploma? How can I deal with this particular technical issue that I always hang up on or memorization or, you know, how do I, mm-hmm. how do I, how do I, how do I, how does someone who's, you know, been through it handle that? And, it's really interesting to see that it isn't just those those you know young artists who are watching those. There are people who are just curious, like how is this done? You know, mm-hmm. how does someone who actually sits down and plays this you know challenging music, this hard to perform music, this you know lightning fast finger music, deal with the technical issues of? Well, I think you had one on how to make your trills more expressive, right? You know, mm-hmm. that's pretty mm-hmm. that's pretty specific uh for, for pianists specific. but but you got a lot of listeners i i'm i'm very grateful that people um i i i just imagine you know uh one individual subscriber from time to time and how they might react to how i hop around <laughs> different topics and how I zoom in and out of how detailed I'm, I'm going. And so how jarring that may, may be for some people. Um, but I, I think it just works because um, at the end of the day, I really don't know. Uh, and I can't put my finger on exactly the type of viewer that I have because there, there are many. And, and, and you just have to accept the fact that sometimes a certain topic will not resonate with a viewer but a, but that same topic may be filling in a void that is very very needed um, for a group of musicians or a group of viewers out there and that it means something to me so I will make the video um, so you just you, you can't always please everybody but um, well you you, you please a lot of people so you know the track record is pretty good hey your your first album, Alice in Wonderland was mm-hmm. released last year, and uh, mm-hmm. and I love the music. It's it's typically Nara-ish in its eclecticism. It includes you know a track with piano, uh, piano and electronics. It has another with prepared piano. Uh, some of it is very highly charged, you know, frenetic, energetic music. Um, some of it is you know has that kind of a tranquility that you know I associate with Sati. Although in Sati's case, I always think that you know. 
he wants you to think it's tranquility, but it's really indifference. Because uh, he's, you know, he's a bit of a... That's a, a great way to put it. Yeah, it's a bit of... he. Well, he was a bit of a joker. You know, he was part of that whole Dadaist thing. Um, in terms of... Tell us a little bit about how that recording evolved, where it got started, and, um, you know, what some of your future plans are. Um. I I was wanting to put together an album for a very long time prior to that project. There's a certain discipline that's required to curate something from start to finish and decide, most importantly, what are you going to put in an album that you're attaching your name to and you're um, curating in a way that ha there's, a, there's a theme or not and, and why would you put these pieces together and put it out there to represent yourself. And, and for me, I knew I, I wanted to do something like that in order to organize some, um, some, some things, I guess, for lack of a better word, um, in my head about my own comp compositional voice. Everything from trying to define it, trying to understand more of it, and trying to organize a chapter of my life because I'm constantly, as any other composer out there is, um, evolving and changing. And um, that process was uh, almost, like, um, almost like a practice of um, making sure that I am I'm sure about my own voice and elements of it and and um, and deciding how to uh, represent that. So that being said, um, all of the pieces on there are are pieces that I was writing leading up to that that year and I never had time nor um, the the will to sit down and and finalize. I would perform these pieces, some of these pieces I was performing um, Yet I never really drafted up my final version of it or um, had it polished in a way. And um, that was largely due to the fact that I was dedicating a lot of time to YouTube and making videos. And I felt that um, like the conveyor belt effect where I just thought I need to continue this. And, and so saying that I'm going to make an album um, and, and focus on that gave me a reason and a structure to carve out time that was just empty time, basically, to gather my thoughts and um, focus in order to finish these pieces and record them. And I ended up producing and, and uh, engineering most of the, uh, the uh, album as well. So it just became a, a big project. And um, while doing so, I took some time off of making videos. Um, and I just, it was a celebration of the piano and, and the, the part of me that really loves keyboards and loves pianism. And, and also um, it was combining all the things that I showed on my YouTube channel, of being inspired by so many different genres and styles. and. And so there's, there's, it's a mixed bag, but um, it, it, it's best representing of the, let's say, three to four years leading up to um, me recording it. Well, it's, it's beautiful. And um, some of the pieces started in improvisation, didn't they? Like Salad, I yes. remember seeing an, an improvised <laughs> version, which you put to, uh, to video uh, visuals of, of yourself making mm -hmm. a salad. Um, Absolutely. And actually, it's something that you've been very eloquent about, which is the need for classical music to reclaim its improvising heritage. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes, um, I think it's, and there are uh, many artists out there that, especially with the use of electronics as well um, and different contemporary techniques, um, many people are embracing improvisation. Um, I think I think there could there's room for more of that, and I love talking about that and sharing things about that on my channel. And I like it as a personal form of growth and challenge for me as well, because I come from a place where, at first, I was not comfortable with improvisation, but 
tracks like Solid Music, it started off with, uh, like you said, I made footage uh, of, of, of me tossing a salad and it was a sort of an analogy um, for putting together different little elements um, in the music and mixing them together uh, and, and finding pitches that work together. Um, maybe it's in a certain mode or a certain sound. And, and I, you know, just, just by combining different um, pitches, you can, you can get something that uh, sounds different or, or similar. And so I, I did, um, expand on that for the for the album that's great and and it it is interesting because you know uh for people who think that jazz is the only place where improvisation i mean you know mozart improvised beethoven improvised you know in if you go back a couple hundred years before them in the early music world they improvised a lot um on instruments like the lute baroque composers you know improvised ornaments a lot bach improvised whole pieces and in, in this time, the organists still improvise a lot. That's still a big p- part of their training. Um, I know because we made records with organists who could basically improvise for an hour. Um, whether you actually want to listen to it for an hour is another question, but <laughs> they they could do it. Um, so now you have this album. It's a great album. I think everyone should go out and, and listen to it. It's uh, I highly recommend it. Um, do you have your um your site set on um other realms orchestral music chamber music uh film scoring opera even yes um in fact all of those things um i i i am working on um putting together another album which um it's is sort of delayed because of uh, the pandemic and everything, but um, I I would like to explore a little more with synthesizers, which I really love, and expanded orchestration, everything from small ensembles to maybe even a chamber orchestra. Um, and in the last two years, I've been writing more and more for uh, instrumentation that is not just keyboard or, or uh, solo piano. In fact more pieces that are not for that than, than, than just piano. Um, I wrote a piece for piano and chamber orchestra that I'll um, perform in Manitoba in a few months. Um, I'm working with uh, a vocalist I, I'm, that, that I'm new to, writing text and, and looking for text. Um, I did a little bit of film scoring as well uh, earlier earlier this last year um, and was was graciously um, granted uh, uh, an opportunity to write a, for a cue in Boss Baby 2. Um, it's an animated movie and um, I worked with Hans Zimmer and his team um, and Steve Massaro uh, and I wrote a piece for full orchestra and many other soloists for that. So that was very exciting and very different um, and yes, I, I hope to put out more music formally, um, in the coming future that, that represents this side of my, uh, compositions. That's great. Well, we will be li- listening with great interest. And I, I saw the videos, um, about your work with the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra, which, um, uh, was that one commission piece, um, that you, you um, it was actually several because, um, the original date for the the performance of the piece for piano and chamber orchestra that was postponed due to lockdown and everything. So um, they uh, had a, a great remote um, virtual program set up, and so they commissioned some solo pieces and also a piece for uh, piano violin, which is about to be premiered. So that that is very exciting. That is fantastic. That's great. Well, mm-hmm. we'll listen with interest for that as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about music and mental health to make a, a pretty big shift. Um, as I think you know, it's a subject that's very near and dear to our hearts here at the Glenn Gould Foundation since we 
recently launched the instrumental project, um, which is aimed at teens and helping them to reap the benefits of being more deeply engaged with music in terms of their own inner well-being. Um, now you're in a kind of a self-directed musical career, um, and it's one that doesn't have a well-established playbook to guide you. Um, you've talked about how being a musician in today's world also means you have to be your own manager, your own mini media company. You have to be your own promotion company. Um, that's a, a much more anxiety-ridden and precarious and frankly stressful way to live as a musician. How do you cope with those aspects of your career um, and the changing face of the industry? And while you're making a living from your music, are you still able to turn to it and find peace of mind and comfort and joy and a sense of healing uh, when, you know, times are getting tough and stressful? Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of heavy questions. In yeah, there. I know. Um, that, that was a little, what we call the, the minefield question. The, the minefield yes. question. Um, I, let me go backwards. I do find a lot of comfort, a lot of joy in just sitting at a piano and making music. And I'm, and and I've I would say I've worked hard at protecting that part of things because I from from experience because I've had times where I I completely let the work side of things override um, my just pure inspiration for making music and everything and that really was soul crushing and and um, and I just very simply observed the decline of my mental health, the decline of my mood, my will to do things, and just my um, liveliness in general when, when I let that happen. And I just realized that even though music and that side of music is something that I just so adore and love, that... Um, that space is not going to be protected automatically. I have to actively manage it so that I make sure that I have a certain time and space throughout the day or throughout the week or wherever I can fit it in. Um, because uh, if you just let it let things happen um, by by chance, then things like deadlines and uh, pressing urgent, pieces in the in the schedule will always take over and and your passions and your um, emotional needs all that they don't have deadlines and they don't have time frames they're not put in the agenda so I just learned it the hard way over the years that I need to manage myself so that you know I do it in, in different ways I remind myself by scheduling things and um, I check in with myself um, I talked about it recently in a video. You, you have to kind of separate yourself so that there's a part of you that shows up as a musician, as, um, as any creative person. And then there's a part of you that um, is overseeing everything and just making sure, okay, are you taking care of the deadlines and the projects so that you're not overwhelmed? And are you leaving room so that you're taking care of yourself and your passions and your interests and um, whatever else that needs to be taken care of. Um, a lot of it has to do with time management and making sure that um, you are investing in the little annoying tasks uh, right away so that later on you're not going to have to pay for, you know, things that are just piled up and, um, I, I just think it's it's overseeing all, a lot of diff right. different details. And um, what was the other question that was? I, I remember you asked something that I. Well, that that um, there are certain aspects of you know the amount that you have to take upon yourself to build this yes. kind of career that mm -hmm. frankly could be the opposite of what we turn to music for, which is it could be right, destructive right. to your mental health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's easy to get overwhelmed, mm -hmm. um, just by doing, just by living today. Yes, <laughs> true. 2022. True enough. It doesn't matter if you're a musician, um, if you have a, a desk job, uh, 
an athlete, whatever you're doing, it's, it's so easy to be overwhelmed because any field comes attached with so many extras uh, that you have to learn and you, you kind of have to comply to and, and things are changing, you know, everything from the way we work the, uh, and, and never mind the pandemic, um, technology is moving really fast and people, the people's interests and, and what, um, what is being demanded of us as musicians or whatever field is always changing. Um, I am very overwhelmed by that uh, every season because despite my efforts and I talked about how I, I try to manage everything and, and I, I do give myself credit for coming to a place where I, 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 I won't fall apart or at least I haven't so far. <laughs> But every season, I do come to a point where I feel not just a burnout, um, but um, this dark space where I start to question, okay, things are going and I, and I am taking care of things, but there's something that I can't quite put my finger on why I feel this sense of gloom and, and this... this um, just this cloud over me. And I think it's, it's a normal, it could be seasonal, uh, literally, or it could just be a product of um, compounding exhaustion. But I am very aware of that. And I see that being consistent amongst pretty much all of my friends, especially musician friends. Yeah, I, I think there's an anxiety. You have gone through the previous season. So you've basically you know, sort of climbed Mount Everest. And now it's a, a new season and you're right at the bottom of the mountain all over again. And you're wondering mm -hmm. how are you going to, except that part of the rules if you're a musician is when you climb it, you have to climb it with a different route. You have to take a different yes. path because you can't repeat yourself. And that can be very stress producing for sure. And some, somehow, you know, I mean, it's easy to say hard to do. Part of it is just saying, okay, you know, I feel really crappy about this, but I'm just going to throw myself onto the mountain and up we go. And, you know, and, and there's also part of the, the, and I can speak from personal experience having, you know, um, you know, had a record company that when you have to think of it as the thing that you earn your living from, it can, there's a risk that it's going to change your relationship to music. Yes. You know, in my case, it was, you know, rather than, I did this because of the sheer joy that I always experienced and how precious the music was to me. It, it then becomes, oh, that's really good. How, uh, how much of this can we sell? You know, uh, mm -hmm. and that's that's a very tough change. I think you really have to be able to build some really powerful compartments and separate these pieces so that one doesn't mm -hmm. kind of ruin the other. Definitely, definitely. You you put it you put it so nicely and. Um... I, I would I would say it's just a, a constant learning curve. You have to figure it out as you go. Um, and I, as I'm continuing on, I'm always trying to. I'm very aware of the the ups and downs of it all, uh, uh, emotionally and and spiritually too. And what what I find is very helpful is that on days where I am overwhelmed by everything um, and, or, or, and or I feel a lack of inspiration um, because this has become my work and it's very, there's something very dry about that. Um, I start to pull back and I pay attention to things that, um, that I'm just, uh, maybe it sounds cliche, but I'm just very grateful for. And they, they're not big um, they are big things, but I try to focus on every little detail and things that maybe are to me so obvious now. Um, like I was talking to my the, my friend other the other day, and I was talking about you know, isn't it amazing that just the piano exists? Uh, like we were we we're born after the piano uh, was invented, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I didn't have control over that and the fact that these pianos are still being made and 
Um, I could put it in a room where you know, it, it supports the weight of the piano and things like, I appreciate great plumbing in, in the, the apartment, you know? What would happen if I don't have water? Or absolutely, you know? and let's it, you know, uh, let's face it. You you go back one hundred and twenty years, even a mm -hmm. hundred years, and there are lots of people in lots of cities in North America and Europe yes, who did not have plumbing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and a comfortable situation. But if I try to imagine the alternative, that is the worst of the worst. Then, you know. I'll take this any 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 day. So it's just a matter of kind of rewiring certain things. But there's a lot of maintenance. I I, I will say this to you and say it out loud, and be aware of it in this moment. But it doesn't take much for me to forget about this and then get into a place where I just am am just overwhelmed by the fact that you know, I have to walk over to the piano. You know, little thing. It just it's so irrational. And I think it's just part of being human. You know, we'll, we have to just rewire and remind ourselves and parts of ourselves that um, there are other ways to think about this that will prevent you from wanting to, you know, <laughs> self-employ. I, I think you just reinvented the song Count Your Blessings. Count Your Blessings. Count Your Blessings. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's um, overstated, but it's true. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, I, I've noticed that there are certain recurring elements that, you know, make uh, repeat appearances in your videos. Happy birthday is yes. one. For Elise is another, the piece that you that you love to hate. Um, your adorable dogs, occasionally your lovely mother is another. Um, but Glenn Gould is in there too. He, he makes an appearance every now and then. Yes. And since this is his 90th birthday year, let's talk a little bit about him. What uh, what fascinates you? I mean, you went to the Glenn Gould School, so presumably you got a fair um, exposure to Gould and his legacy. But, you know, what what is it about him that you think um, makes him a an interesting musical figure to this day? I admire, first and for, foremost, just simply his his playing and and how how transported I am when, when he's playing and, and when I hear his recordings and I'm not thinking about the interpretation or the, the pianist, um, even though it's so specifically Glenn Gould, uh, I'm hearing the music as if it's, he's creating it together with the composer. Um, and I think that's very unique and very hard to do as a pianist playing someone else's work, um, to be so fixed into the actual work because his interpretation is almost compositional, yet keep the integrity of the composer. Um, and and um, uh, many, many purists might say that his Bach um, interpretations are um, a bit extreme or not ideal but for me it is because um when he plays it he convinces me with his sense of timing with his um articulation and everything behind the music that um i'm convinced and that's all that matters mm -hmm. another thing that i really admire about glenn gold is that he pioneered the art of recording mm -hmm. and the ar art of technology related to the performing artists, especially as a classical musician. All right. Thank you so much. Um, it's been great to, to speak with you today. Thank you. Um, I feel like yeah, if Glenn Gould were around today, he would have said, you know, this is a kindred spirit, someone who, you know, basically decided, you know, not to become a, uh, a concert pianist, but uh, explored technology as a way of unlocking her creativity and finding new and more intimate ways of communicating with an audience. And I hope that uh, you will keep on doing that and be um, really exploring your inner creativity for a wide and growing audience, putting the way for new generations of classical musicians and uh, helping bring that music to a, uh, a broader audience around the world. 
So thank you again, Nari. It's been fantastic to have you. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate it. The Glenn Gould Foundation is a registered Canadian charity and we rely on the support of arts lovers like you to keep bringing inspiring stories to life. Please consider giving by visiting our website, glengould.ca, and follow us across social media at the Glenn Gould Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of The Gould Standard.